So here's something I wanted to mention. If you're going to put strain gauges on the right side, as I have done, which I've done so because getting all the electrical wires through into the center axle from this left hand side, which is obviously the removable crank, would be rather tricky. And I don't really want to put all the electronics on the outside of this crank alone. But one thing you need to be aware of, which is not immediately obvious, is the transfer of torque from the left hand side to the strain gauges on the right hand side. Because it's easy to look at this and think the torque here, for example, is transferred through the crank, through the axle, onto the chain and the wheel. And so the, the right hand side crank is just hanging off there and shouldn't be affected at all. Well, that's not the case. And what I've discovered in a little bit of testing is that it varies depending on the position of the crank. So in this position, pushing forwards, there's pretty much no effect at all. Around here, there's around about, for every 10 kilograms applied to the left-hand side, we're getting about 400 grams transferred, negative 400 grams to the right-hand side. Around here, it's about 1.3 kilograms, negative 1.3 kilograms for every 10 pushing back. Here, it drops down to around about 200 grams, negative 200 grams, and about zero at the top. Which, if you look at the way this this is here, it makes sense. So I reckon the peak for transfers around about here, which makes perfect sense because that's exactly where the contact of the chain is on the chain ring there, is right opposite the crank. So it puts the most amount of stress into the metal which is right where the strain gauges are. So I just thought I'd mention that as something to be aware of. In reality, it's very, very difficult to compensate for because you've obviously got no way with a single-sided power meter to actually measure what the torque is on this side. And as I've just demonstrated, it varies depending on the position on the rotation. So all you can do is just fudge the numbers a little bit and just compensate for it. Let's talk about ADC resolution and sample rate and how they work together. This might be obvious and probably is to anyone who's worked with audio because it's basically about recording and replicating a waveform. Now this here is a typical waveform that you get from strain gauges on a bicycle power meter. Now obviously a power meter we're turning the cranks typically with an average around 80 rpm and so this represents approximately one second's worth of waveform. Obviously, if we're at 60 RPM, then the wave would repeat once a second. So with that in mind, if we're sampling at supposedly 80 samples per second, which is like an unmodified HX711, then we're only going to get 80 samples between here and here. As you can see, quite a lot goes on here, which is probably only going to be picked up in about 50 samples. What made me think about this was that I was still getting quite reasonable power data when using an amplifier and the Arduino's 10-bit ADC. And I reckon it was because I was sampling at around 1,000 samples per second. And so this was divided up into 1,000 in this direction. And around about, well, I wasn't using the full range of the ADC, but it would typically be around about five, 600, maybe 700 in the Y direction. So if you think about that, basically if we're sampling a straight line, the steps representation of that is in fairly even steps. I'm going to draw a representation of this waveform at a rate of 14 samples per second using the squares on this graph paper and we'll see what that looks like. The 14 samples per second is very slow and does create a very poor representation of the waveform but the point I'm trying to make is that if you're very precise in the y direction it's not a huge amount of point if 
you got long delays between the samples because although I've drawn this waveform quite smooth in the real world on bumpy road it may be all over the place in here so you're going to miss all that detail so what I'm basically trying to say is to get the best results try and up the sample rate as much as you can on these HX711 boards and uh, that should get you the best results and finally, if you happen to have a power meter to compare your homemade one to and the power data isn't matching up, you're getting an error, here is how to identify what the potential cause of that error is. Firstly, let's look at a calibration error. Now, this is the correct use of the word calibration. This is a value that is hard-coded into the power equation is used to convert the ADC value into torque value, which is then used in the equation. Not what is most commonly referred to as calibration, which is actually the process of finding a value which you subtract or add to the ADC value so that when the force or torque on the crank is zero, the value used in the power equation is also zero. So a calibration error will show up like this. That's if it's high, this is it low. So when power is low, the error will be low. And when power increases, the error also increases. If it is instead a zero offset, so this is when the value, when there's zero force on the crank or zero torque, is not zero. So this is when it's high and this is when it's low. Basically what you see is there will be an overall offset in power. So it doesn't matter whether power is low or whether it's high. There will be a very similar error. Um, and that's basically how to identify from data what the cause might be. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.